um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Yana today. Um, so she started to work at King's College London in 2014 on the Human Connection project. Between 2016 to 2020, during her third highly welcome fellowship, she focused on functional placental MRI and has been involved in a number of projects studying the use of imaging to gain insights into human pregnancy and early development. Uh, she was recently awarded a seven-year UK MRI fellowship focusing on a self-guiding fetal MRI scan. She is developing external sensors and AI to track any motion during the scan in close collaboration with Imperial College, NYU, Siemens Engineers, and North Campus. And I'm very excited to listen to your talk, Anna, and now the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Esra. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very excited to give this talk. I'm also very frightened because obviously a lot of the things I'm going to talk about, you guys are doing as well. Quite a good number of them, you're probably doing better. So any criticism or discussion is very welcome, obviously. Um, so I've given the title multimodal MRI around the time of birth, but in reality, when I made the slides, there was quite a big placenta focus. So I've kicked out the neonatal part to have more placenta time. I hope that's okay. Okay, Let's see if I can advance the slides. Yes, all right. So I'm roughly going to present some multimodal techniques we've developed. Just one example of how we really try now to translate this towards clinical use, which is a technique called applause. I want to give, because I'm quite excited about it at the moment, a quick overview over CARPS, the CARP study, where we also look at the maternal heart now, in addition to the placenta, and then a very brief outlook on MareCAT, which is what my next seven years are going to be. All right, let's jump right into it. I don't think it needs any introduction for you. My placental imaging is important. It's obviously involved in major pregnancy complications these mentioned, but many more. What I find really interesting from a physical point of view is that there is so much to do in terms of the interactions between structure and function. It's a really complex organ. There's flow of different velocities, different levels. There's all this fascinating microstructure. And there was a number of really nice biological hypotheses. Why does this microstructure change? How does this affect the function again? So I just think it is a really exciting area. What we are looking at more and more partly because it annoys us when imaging, but also partly because we, try to, we, we start realizing how relevant they are for the assessment are dynamic processes. So yeah, everybody's familiar with motion, obviously, if working in fetal imaging, but more and more also contractions. And I know that, that you had a recent paper also on contractions, so did Nottingham, so that really seems to be a growing area. That's just one example for those who haven't seen them. This is a, a placental scan at a gradient echo scan at a low echo time. And here you can really see the placenta Let's start again. Yeah. And now the contraction comes in and it completely changes shape, but it also completely changes contrast, obviously, um, which is fascinating, but also really annoying if that happens during a long diffusion scan and it totally messes up all the parameters. So the goal of a lot of that work really has been to focus on bespoke techniques. Of course, we are still using a lot of techniques which we borrow from other parts of radiology for this very specific challenge. So the goal really is, and we are far away from reaching that, but the goal would be to have a bespoke capacity predictive of what happens to this specific pregnancy later on. Focus is also to integrate acquisition and analysis to get quantitative measures. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to present is quantitative. And then there's obviously always the safety limitations of in utero MRI. And that's what I'm going to start with because I sometimes feel it's a bit different how different centers use them. It's probably no, no right and wrong, but just to put what I'm going to show into the, into the um, well, framework of our restrictions. We have quite a big focus on acoustic noise. So we really redesign all the sequences, even normal APIs, to be quiet. We measure every single sequence before we apply it, and we do not freely adapt or rotate our sequences to specific geometries. We always scan everything to maternal planes, because if you would rotate an API, then the sound level would change. So that's something to discuss about. Maybe this is slightly strange, but I guess it's important to have it in mind. We've also started scanning everybody supine. So all our mothers are scanned fully supine, not in left lateral tilt, but we do start them on the left side and then slowly roll them over. We have continuous life monitoring, blood pressure, SATs, and heart rate. And in the few cases where we had vasovagal um, episodes, they were picked up on the blood pressure monitoring before the mother felt it. So these have happened. They have happened rarely, but they have happened. Scan duration, yeah, we're also pretty strict on one hour and we force them to have a break after 30 minutes. We used to offer it, but now we force it for consistency reason. We scan at one and a half inch VT Phillips 
And right now I'm doing the lovely job of transitioning a lot of the sequences I'm going to show to Siemens because we will start um, doing fetal scanning on Siemens mainly. Yeah. Maybe I'm not going to go in detail, but, but, but thanks to the placenta imaging project, which is also how I met Esra and Jeff, um, we've really started having a number of, of placental components in most of our studies. So be this focus on preeclampsia, chronic hypertension, a lot of, lot of work around congenital heart disease, and lately also about preterm birth. There's quite a lot of studies which have started or are about to start. All right, so let's start with multimodal techniques. Again, that is familiar to all of you, I'm sure. There are a number of promising placental modalities which have developed, also driven by the Human Placenta Project. Um, and two of the ones which, which come up and up again and again are T2-star relaxometry and diffusion. And they've really shown great promise. Um, as in, if there is a specifically low T2-star, this is a good, predict, good predictor or a good indicator that this placenta is not functioning that well. Similarly for perfusion, where mainly the a change in ADC has been indicative. Now, these are just some examples. I mean, a normal placenta, normal as in healthy, uncomplicated pregnancy, delivered at term as a normal birth weight. Um, um, and then a, then a placenta, then the T2 star map of a placenta from a woman with chronic hypertension who developed preeclampsia. So obviously, they look very different visually. Similar for the diffusion, here you see ADC maps. They do look very differently, which is something a number of people on both both diffusion and T2 star have, have shown in studies with different, different foci. foci. Foki. Um, but when we look at T2 star, we are really trying to look at oxygenation. And this is a very indirect measure, but this is what it's mainly used for. But there are obviously a number of other things which do influence T2 star time, which influence the transverse, relaxa the relaxation of the transverse magnetization, feed blood volume, hematocrit, volite geometry, and probably many more. Same for diffusion. Certainly gives an indication on microstructure but especially in the placenta as it's so vascular, there are a lot of perfusion effects mix in, transport effects, the light orientation and so on. Which is why we've decided, I think about two years ago, yeah, it's not a very good hypothesis because I think it's pretty obvious, but that um, doing these simultaneously might help us disentangle some of, these, some of these effects. How do you put them together? Well, actually on the acquisition side, they are intrinsic intrinsically linked anyway, because every diffusion scan which is done by acquiring data, different B values, B vectors, B shapes. But any such diffusion, diffusion scan would be acquired at a certain echo time. And same here, which means that these parameters we scan are anyway linked. So why don't we just scan this whole parameter space and see what else comes out and what else we can do with data, with diffusion data, different echo times, as well as, as, as multi echoes at different B values. Well, it's really time consuming to do that in a, in a not bespoke way. And there were not that many bespoke techniques around there. Um, so what, what did we do? Well, this is again just showing if this would be the acquisition time, one T2 or T2 star map, and then a diffusion, and you would get separate maps. This is what, what, what a number of studies now, especially in the UK, have started doing, acquiring diffusion data at different echo times, but in separate scans, which takes quite long. But it allows you to give really enhanced analysis possibilities, because you have sampled this, this larger space I've just shown. But if you do it all together in one big acquisition, then it's faster, there's significantly less motion, and the dynamic effect can be captured, cap captured much better. But you have to deal with a lot more complex parameter choices, but I will come to that later. And we've done that really in a simple way. We basically just extended the diffusion sequence with multiple readouts. There won't be a lot of pulse diagrams, but this was one of the pulse diagram bridge slides, sorry. So again, this is a normal diffusion acquisition, diffusion preparation, excitation refocusing, and then the readout. And if you were to do that in this separate way I've just shown in the middle, then you would repeat this as a different TE, which includes a lot of that time into the sequence, which is not needed. So instead, you can also just keep going um, and keep acquiring the data at different, different echo times while it, while it decays away. And that is much faster. That is the, one of the primary motivations of doing it this way. And that's a technique which is called SEPRA, but that will become obvious in a number of slides. <laughs> what do we now do with it? So this is a technique we are using on the 3T. Um, we've scanned 286 women now between 16 and 41 weeks. Scan takes 8 minutes, 30 seconds, and it gives us a really wide range of, of B values and TEs. So between 78 and 220, and the B values similarly. Um, lots of them, and choose it in a way that we could do DTI type analysis or IVIM type analysis as well. 
This is how some of the data looks completely raw, un unprocessed, uncorrected, nothing. And now um, the analysis of this, this is very close collaboration with UCL, with Daniel Alexander's group, and uh, mainly with Paddy Slatter, which I think some of you know well as well. Um, and he has really been working on, on, on the analysis on, on how to integrate this. So maybe let's jump right to the image. So if we had acquired only B values, we could get this ADC value here. If we had acquired only different echo times, we would get one T to star value. But now having acquired this whole space, with all this data across all B values and TEs, we can now look at these spectra. And this is now the joint 2D distribution of the ADC and T to star values. So we did that relatively blind. We acquired the data and then we looked at the spectrum and tried to interpret it. But roughly based on the diffusivity and the T to star, this is water which is trapped in tissue, probably in the villi. This is slower perfusing blood, which could be related to exchange. And here we have faster flowing blood, which might be the maternal inflow. But again, this is up to discussion and criticism. <laughs> now we've done quite a bunch of them. And when you look at them over gestation, this is now ordered by gestational age. You can see that this three peak structure is largely really maintained over gestation, but it moves slightly. Oh, that was too fast. But very interestingly, the last, last row, these are non-healthy placentas. So these are placentas from women with chronic hypertension. Here is FGR and preeclampsia, and here preeclampsia again. And you can really see the spectrum changing pretty completely. One or both of the higher peaks here disappears. The lowest peak has really lower T to star, as well as lower diffusivity. So it sort of moves into the lower left corner and has some peaks disappearing. Um, and here, this was quite nice. This was the same participant scanned three weeks apart, where we wanted to check robustness. And it looks pretty much the same, but again, this exchange peak has disappeared even, even further. Um, and now, Patty has really brought it to a different level. And this was just in time for this talk, except yesterday at medical image analysis. So now we're not looking at three components, but it's seven, and trying to tease apart what they could potentially mean. Um, I'm not going to go in the interpretation of, of, of all of these really in detail, but what we're looking at here now is really the color shows the fraction. So the more yellow, the larger is the fraction in this voxel of this specific component. And if we put it together in a bit more pulp palpable format, um, now we have just color, color coded the individual components and show the voxel in the component which is most, most prevalent in this, in this voxel. And again, you can see really nicely that there are certain components in these two placentas here. Again, these are the same examples with preeclampsia. Um, certain of these, of these microstructural components which, which, which are prevalent. And this is um, very much, very, very much work in progress where we are now trying to really understand what do these different components mean? What can they tell us? How can we validate this um, in the future? Ah, yeah. So we're also applying this to one of our one of our other cohorts, which is a slightly frustrating cohort. These are women who have prolonged preterm rupture of the membranes. Um, these are notorically difficult to get into the scanner um, for very obvious reasons, and the time time we have till they are delivered is typically quite short. But they are quite interesting because um, we would love to be able to see markers of inflammatory response, be it in the placenta, the umbilical or in the fetus using MRI, which, which could potentially inform later on the time point of delivery. So this is now work led by Lisa Sturry, who is one of our obstetricians. And we have sort of employed the same protocol. And we've looked first only at the T to star maps, which do visually look different, um, very, very, very heterogeneous, but, but, but quite clearly different than the normal and the preeclamptic placentas, for example. Quantitative analysis was a bit sad. This was rightly rejected a couple of times already from journals because it doesn't tell us very much. So we've, we've now extended this as well and looked at this more comprehensive seven component analysis, which again is joint work with UCL. Again, I'm not going to go too much in details, but um, what is sort of emerging is that there might be some of, these, some of these markers coming out from the modeling, which are related, for example, to the duration between the rupture of the membranes and the time point of delivery, which is quite exciting. But again, very, very much ongoing work. And any, any further idea or any discussion at the end is more than welcome on that. Yeah, what about other contrasts? So diffusion T to star is, is, is sort of, was a logical combination for us to start with, but we've obviously extended this also to T1, which now gives us a cube to sample. The B space, echo time and inversion time, which is something which has been done a hell of a lot already in, in the human brain. 
but we wanted to also use this on the placenta. So how is this typically then? These are the, this is the last slide with pulse, uh, with pulse, pulse sequences. Again, we have our normal diffusion preparation followed by the EPI readout. What you can now do is to add a non-selective inversion, which inverts the entire magnetization and while it recovers, we scan. To scan at a first inversion time, it's quite easy. You, we don't have to wait very long and we scan at the first inversion time. But to sample this recovery curve so that we can get T1 information, we would also need to do a scan sort of later on. And this is again something which has been done, playing this inversion pulse, waiting a really long time, and then get data at, a, say, an inversion time of two seconds. Um, but it, obviously, this is really, really inefficient. And this is just single slot, single shot. So you would have to do this for every slice. The inversion, however, is non-slice selective. And this is quite important because this allows you to really speed things up. This now is something which has been proposed by Nottingham about 20 years ago. So they, again, played the non-selective inversion. Entire magnetization is inverted. And now while it recovers, we sample first slice, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. Now, every slice is a different inversion time, which isn't very practicable if you want to do any type of modeling. And the images look, the volumes look really odd because literally every slice has a different inversion time. But now you can start shuffling this around. And this is, as I said, work by actually 30 years ago, sorry, work by Nottingham, where you would invert again, but now instead of starting with slice one, you start with slice two and so on. Oops. And this is a very efficient way to, to sample the recovery curve. However, it's still not super efficient because you are limited by the number of slices. So you cannot really undersample more than the number of slices because you have to shuffle this around to sample everybody with every inversion time. So this is a clear oversampling of the recovery curve. What can we do to undersample it? This is when we came up again with this pretty simple idea, but which, which seems to work quite nicely. Why do we actually scan the whole volume with one diffusion encoding for every slice? Like right at the moment, we would choose a B, B2000 and then scan every slice in this volume and then use the next D value and so on and so on. But there's no real good reason for it. If we change the diffusion encoding every slice, we undersample the recovery curve, which means we get a very efficient, fast sampling of the inversion. Um, and we get, if we do the shuffling right, we get data which looks inc incredibly stripy, but which can be recomposed to absolutely normal volumes because we end up sampling everything with the same inversion times and the same B values. This is why this method is referred to as SEPRA because before processing, the data looks a bit like a stripy sepper. All right, oh, no, I'm not going to talk about that. Back to the placenta. And again, this is now under, under revision number three already. Um, so this is now, this is not this technique applied on the placenta and I'm going to jump straight to the results. So this is now a, a technique on the placenta which allows you to get an under two minutes ADC and T1 information of, of the whole placenta, of all the slices. ADC maps look like ADC maps are supposed to look. These are the T1 maps. And T1 is slightly more tricky because there's not that much literature. So we don't really know 100% what to expect. But they are roughly in range with what literature would tell us indeed. Um, and uh, what is nice about it is that it's completely, because it's acquired in the same acquisition, it's completely co-registered. So you can now really look for every voxel. What is the ADC? What is the T1? In a very lucky case that there's a contraction happening during the scan, we can now also look in parallel, how does the ADC value as a measure of microstructure change in parallel to the T1, which I think is really fascinating. You can also quantify this, but this is, again, this is very early days. We have sampled about four preeclamptic placentas. So this is, this is something we're working on. Another thing which is, I think, quite interesting is, is this curve. I'm going to try to explain. <laughs> so here we see the mean T1 of the placenta. If we only do a T1 fit, so not mixed with diffusion, but just taking the B0 data. And this is now this joint fit, where we are really trying to tease apart elements due to T1 and to, then to diffusion. And this is quite interesting because you can see this clear progression and this clear change. So measuring T1 alone gives you a different answer. And in this case, normally a, a higher value than if you would do this joint fit. And this is something we are now looking in detail. It's quite interesting because the differences are spatially mostly in the centers of the lobules, which is again, as I've promised, all this is very much work in progress. So this is, this is another analysis uh, challenge we are working on. Yeah, don't wanna, don't wanna bore you with that, but <laughs> similarly, we have now, now, we have also done this with perfusion, um, where we realizing that T2 star is obviously widely used in the placenta, 
also perfusion starts to be used quite a lot. Um, and both are obviously combined. It would be lovely to look at the perfusion of blood into the placenta and inside the placenta, and then are there any changes G2 star associated with that and how are they spatially localized? Well, really similarly to all the other techniques, acquisition-wise, they live in a space anyway. In this case, this space. <laughs> so why don't we just sample the whole space and put it together? And this is what this perfox technique is doing. We're using velocity selective ASL for all our placental perfusion imaging. The reason being that in velocity selective ASL, you don't need to have a tagging plane, which is quite tricky with the uterine arteries, but you label based on the velocity of, well, in this case of blood. And again, instead of just sampling one echo, we have modified the sequence to sample multiple echoes in each of these, in each of these preparations. Mm. Okay, <laughs> let's go straight to the data again. <laughs> this is how some of the data looks. So first, second, third echo, and then as always in ASL, we have label, control, label, control. This again is done simultaneously, which is quite nice because now you can get T to star maps if you wanted to, or perfusion maps from the first echo. But now we again have a bigger, bigger, bigger parameter space. So we can also look at a perfusion weighted T to star map and what that might entail. These are again just, I won't, won't have time to go into any details, but these are just some of the, some of the results with this technique where now in blue we have the perfusion weighting and in well, orange hot color map, I guess, the, the T to star maps. Um, they don't need to be registered or anything because they are naturally sampled simultaneously in the same space. And it's quite nice because you see the perfusion coming in and then you see clearly linked to it, but a little bit closer to the fetal chorionic plate, you see these hot spots of, of T to star. I think here it's even more obvious. Um, and again, and unfortunately this happened yet, this has not happened yet, but we would love to see this during a contraction. What is actually happening? How is the perfusion changing to the placenta? Um, and what does that do to the T to star value, which we use as a surrogate for oxygen? Um, so a lot of these, these techniques we acquire now in large studies and we are hoping to be lucky to, to get it, um, to get it in, in an interesting contraction. Okay, very briefly, so the human placenta project is now over, so we really wanted to now translate this to clinical use. Um, the status has been, well, we have these T to star maps. We know they're interesting. We have these normal curves. We know how they're supposed to look. We can look at histograms, which gives us a bit more information. But at the end of the day, a lot of these studies um, in, our, in our institution have been, well, this is how normal behaves over gestation. Now we have a, now we, now, now we, now we have women with, for example, preeclampsia. Then we go through the time consuming process of segmenting this and then plotting this in the sort of same reference space and, and going from there. And the idea was if this would be feasible clinically, then it would need to be fully automatic. And that's what, that's what, this, um, that's what this technique is doing. Well, it's called applause, which is not an animal, which clearly indicates that I'm not the first author on that. But this is worked by Max Peach, another colleague of mine. Um, and what this, this really has achieved now is that we have this really short T to star full uterus scan, 26 seconds. Segmentation is fully automatic using UNETs. And then this is quantified using Gaussian processes. For training, we've had, thanks to the HPP, really amazing rich data, which was com completely characterized in terms of clinical results, ultrasound results, histopathology, and outcome. So this is our training data. Then we've done the segmentation with a modified UNET using a lot of data augmentation because despite 190 sounding a lot for placentas, it is not a lot in the machine learning world. Um, then we've evaluated the segmentations. Very, embar very embar embarrassingly, uh, the unit was very fast, better than a lot of our manual segmentations and showed us areas we've missed out. So that is nice. And then this age prediction part, which is basically, basically a Gaussian process, which is trained on data labeled as normal. And um, this model can then be applied to the not normal cases, in this case using mean, and then we can look at the chronological age. So we might have scanned this woman, for example, at 20 week, but the predicted age based on this, this process would be something like 36. So we would know we are in trouble here. We've added this to any fetal scan at St. Thomas's. There are a couple of hundred fetal, um, um, fetal MRI scans in our hospital. We have about 800 data sets available now on all sorts of cohorts, but the big ones are labeled here. Preeclampsia, gross restriction, congenital heart disease, quite a lot. Um, sickle cell disease, twins, and so on. So this is sort of the first very, very, very small step towards clinical translation. Um, 
will I go in detail here? Hmm. Maybe just highlighting these two things. So this is now evaluating. So at the end of this, at the end of this, at the end of this Gaussian process, you get this, this probability of accelerated aging or the predicted biological age. And here this is correlated with the gestation at birth, which for example, just quite a quite nice correlation. We've also evaluated that this, this first is histopathology, where again a set score or or the correlated aging probability. Um, if this was if this was really low, this correlated in this cohort with placental insufficiency really nicely with the finding of, of MBM in the, in the histopathology. But again, the numbers are small, there's no doubt, and this is ongoing work. At the end, there are these AOC curves. I guess, I guess everybody who has looked at placentas from cases with placental insufficiency is not surprised that these numbers are relatively high because these placentas do look completely different. I guess the only advance here is to get this completely automatic now. The data is from the scanner being transferred, processed, and then we get, we get this, this assessment. Yeah, won't, we'll skip this and jump right into CARB. All right, um, CARB study is, um, is a study we, again, started a little while ago, um, and it, it's focusing on preeclampsia, but it's mainly focusing on the, the high risk of cardiovascular disease in later life, so after the index pregnancy. There's still really a poor predictive cap cap capability, which mom will develop cardiovascular diseases later. Um, it's not so clear what the intervention is, and the etiology remains heavily understudied. One of the reasons might be that a lot of studies are focusing either on biomarkers or on the placenta, but not sort of joining these up. So the goal of this, this study um, is to get a better understanding. What is, what a, how can you actually quantify the maternal heart during this time of maximal stress while she's clinically diagnosed with preeclampsia? How does this relate to the placental phenotype? And can we use these two together to predict her later, later life risk? This study really has suffered badly under COVID because we couldn't recruit pretty much anyone in the last year. So we are still standing at 32 scans. <laughs> But these 32 have gone through this protocol. So we have our placental MRI scans, which include all the ones I've shown you earlier. We do get biomarkers and we get a maternal CMR scan from the, from the pregnant mother. We do this at two time points between 16 and 20 weeks and between 26 and 34 weeks. We also plan to add a third time point after delivery. But again, this has been really thrown off the rails due to the pandemic last year. Um, so yeah, as I said earlier, two sessions, we always do these two sessions with an enforced break and we randomly allocate whether we start with the heart, with the cardiac half or with the placental half to minimize any bias we could get from stress of the mother going in the scanner. These are pretty standard cardiac sequences, just all adapted to use in pregnancy, which mainly means lower SAR and um, lower acoustic noise. And we also have a free breathing option because the breath holds in the normal flow and cardiac sequences would have been too long for our mothers. And then we get some metrics of cardiac morphology out of this um, and some metrics of placental morphology and function. So these are just, as I said, the data of the first 32. Um, we will get another 88, hopefully. Um, but that, that, that's the first sort of data. Well, the placental phenotype, very much what we've seen before, low T to star really in these cases, um, high kurtosis and skewness, which are histogram-based measures we use quite a lot for our placental data, which pretty much depict the heterogeneity of the placental, um, of the placental T to star. So this is as expected. What was new was the heart, just some of the, some of the, some of the hard raw images. Then together with colleagues, we do a manual segmentation of the left ventricle, then a statistical shape model is applied in the discriminant analysis of the 12 birth modes. And the signature of preeclampsia, even if the numbers are so low, is super clear. Um, they have thicker walls and more spherical apical regions than in controlled pregnancies. So surprisingly clear emerging phenotype. And this is to a certain degree also shown in the cardiac index, which is not significantly lower, but lower, as well as the well, diastolic pressure and the cardiac work. Um, so now we're really at the stage of putting this all together and looking what, what we can get out of it. But it is a protocol in 60 minutes where we can scan placenta and the maternal cardiovascular system. Um, and again, lots of data. Um, and we're now, we're now trying to correlate this to also look at the biomarkers. So that's why I'm really excited about this sort of multi-organ, multi-marker multi study. Okay, just to finish this off, um, very quick outlook on the MareCAT study. You see, I'm trying to build a zoo. 
So the MARCAD study is a fellowship I was awarded uh, last year. As like Esra said, it's a seven year fellowship um, with a lot of collaborators and a, lot, and a relatively big pot of money. It's one and a half million. So I'm uh, standing at the beginning of it and I'm a bit puzzled, but I will do. But what the main idea is, I'm just going to show you in two slides. And again, feedback is more than welcome. What we've realized is that a normal fetal examination, at least in our center, can be quite rigid. So we get the mother in the scanner and the baby. And then there's always ongoing fetal life. So let's say in these 60 minutes might be a period of increased activity. You might have a contraction. Baby might be asleep or thinking. And there might be a period where we could see some, some, um, some muscular activity in the chest. However, and let's say we scan her because we suspect she has fetal growth restriction. However, the acquisition is relatively rigid, sort of a fixed protocol we acquire. Some of them we might use our combined scans, but still it's quite rigid and it's quite suboptimal. In periods of increased fetal activity, and if we do high-res anat anatomy scans, there is motion corruption and a lot of people repeat. I know there's less and less repetition thanks to the SVR techniques, also um, obviously in your center, and also the ongoing real-time work where individual slices can now be spotted in real time and then repeated. However, let's for the sake of this argument say, it's still true that there are a number of repetitions, be it slices or whole stacks, which need to happen. Well, there might be a contraction happening then, which I'm very sad about because this is a really missed opportunity to see what happens in the placenta. How does perfusion, T1, T2 star diffusion, how do, how do these change together? So that is, that is really sad. And then what happens very often, we always get this video for the mom, which is mainly a recruitment tool. Um, and these always happen to, happen to happen during periods of limited fetal activity, which is not great use of the time. And again, if we look at the placenta and would love to have a contraction, but there's fetal breathing, it doesn't really help us. And very often we run out of time. And then later in the scan, one of our radiologists tells us, oh, there is a really, really big scar in the uterus, something we should look in more detail or any other incidental finding. So it's not optimal. So what Merkid is trying to do, well, first of all, we're going to add an MR-compatible Doppler ultrasound device, which will be on the mother during the entire scan. This is collaboration with a small company in Hamburg, uh, North. And then we are really going to put the fetus on the steering wheel. And it sounds a bit like science fiction, but I have seven years, so I'm allowed. And now the idea really is during the whole scan to get real-time information from the external sensor, that might be heart rate information, contraction information, or anything similar and obviously using AI in real time to look at the data. And then to have this self-driving multi-contrast scan. First, a survey to rapidly defining the focus. We might start with anatomy, but if we realize there's increased activity, well, no, let's change to dynamics and capture this. If there's a contraction, amazing. Let's change to some more functional placental focus scans. Limited activity, great. Let's get amazing motion-free data, microstructure and anatomy. Same here, let's get additional information on breathing. And the pitch is that this will even be faster because we end up not repeating and we end up getting quite bespoke information. All right. Well, thank you for this attention. Thank you for your attention. I leave you with this slightly science fiction slide. A huge thanks to all the, all the funding bodies, mainly to my two fellowships now. And as you've seen, very importantly, the, the image on the first slide was my daughter at around 20 weeks. She has now grown up and is five. Um, yeah, and that's me doing some public outreach on the South Bank in London which is something else I really enjoy doing. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Yama, that was wonderful. Bit of a whirlwind tour, sorry. <laughs> that was amazing talk, thank you so much. And we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Uh, so is there any question from the audience? Uh, hi. Yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. And I have a quick question in placenta diffusion. Yeah, I have two questions. And in placenta diffusion imaging, what's the what's the biological meaning of the FA and ADC value changes, and how how is it associated with the placenta function? Well, I guess we would love to know that. <laughs> um, that is, that is something which I think is, is missing a lot in a lot of these studies, which is the validation, for example, with histopathology or with any other external measurement, which is tricky to do. I mean, we have certain theories what it could be related like, that, that, that larger FA might be due to changes in the, in the villi structure or to damage in the villi. But I think these are all speculations. 
And I know that you guys are also doing quite amazing um, ex vivo work, which might be able to sort of validate some of these and put this in a better, better context. That's something we're not really doing at all. No ex vivo scanning. Slightly evasive answer, sorry. <laughs> okay. And I have one more question. We, we quickly, you quickly talked about fetal brain age predictions. So I'm, I'm wondering what imaging data was used for fetal brain age. Oh, so this was, I was talking about placental age. Oh, placental age. Not, yeah. Not a fetal brain. Okay. We also, we also, and this is another policy I might, I should have highlighted on the first slide. Even if we scan a woman uniquely for placental reasons, we always get full brain imaging. So we probably would be able to do a brain age prediction, mm -hmm. but we, I, not in, not, in none of the studies I've shown you, but we always have full uterus and, and specific full planes for the brain available mm. as a policy and for clinical reporting in a lot of cases. Okay, thank yeah, you. About this diffusion T2 star acquisition, I, uh, so you are limited with lowest TE uh, that you are using. I think you said like 70, around 70 milliseconds that you are using the lowest TE value. Is it limiting your T T2 star estimation, especially for preeclampsia case and higher gestational age? Did you observe any limitation of that? Definitely. This is, this is a difficult balance to make. Um, we went as low as we could by using quite extensively uh, parallel imaging, partial Fourier, all the, all the normal sub suspects. But especially in late gestation, if the mother has an addition preeclampsia, as you say, for example, um, mm -hmm. it is on the lower range. Not in normal pregnancy. We've done quite a lot of validation experiments so that we can even go up to 40 weeks. And we are not in any regime where, where one of the fourth or fifth echo would be only noise. But it would definitely be better to go lower, no doubt. And our limitation here is mainly acoustic noise because of the inter-echo spacing of the EPI, which end of then the diffusion. You, uh, so you said you are transferring the acquisition to Siemens. Is it changing anything to the scanner for, in terms of noise uh, calculations? Is there any difference between vendors, do you think, um, or is it simi similar limitations? Well, it's always linked to the, to the frequency response function of the scanner, which is intrinsic mm -hmm. to every, every and each individual scanner. So there are frequencies which are just really bad because they hit certain harmonics. There are some of these both on Philips and both on our Siemens scanners, even different ones on the different Siemens scanners. So I guess it might not be that vendor specific. Um, okay. But we are still going to have the same safety approach. Mm -hmm. so we are still going to measure everything and this is going to be a limitation going forward, no doubt. I have a question. Um, uh, beautiful work. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering, like, like more biological, medical, like, focus. Uh, what maternal factors are you collecting? I guess that's a prospective study, and you're also gathering a lot of like medically relevant information. So I'm just wondering what your focus on. Um, so in terms of the database, we are focusing. We are we are, use, we are collecting the usual demographics. I would say anything from smoking history, alcohol history ethnicity, prior obstetric history, any medication, any, any, any clinical information on the pregnancy, we have quite an extensive database. We always have a gross, gross ultrasound scan, which is done in parallel to our MRI scans. So we have sort of the full normal, <laughs> let's say, parameters, um, including, including the Doppler parameters. In the CARP study, for example, we also take serum, blood serum, and then a, a bit of it is still frozen and will remain frozen for a while, just in case that we can think of any cool factors in the blood, which are interesting. What else are we collecting? I think that's about it. And multi-gestation pregnancy, I guess you're also acquiring that too, or that's like exclusion criteria, Sorry? like twins, twins or triplets, or you're just focused on singletons? So, for, for what, I, what I showed you, what we've now added to the clinical protocol, we have a lot of twins and not very many triplets, but some. <laughs> but for our research study, for most of them, this is an exclusion criteria, just because we wouldn't really be able to correlate things that easily. Awesome, thank you. Yana, if I could ask you a question. Thank you so much for sharing all this amazing results and thoughts with us. Um, just fan, you do fan, such fantastic work, but 
Um, this question of biological age of the placenta, I think, is really interesting. It's something we've been kind of conceptualizing as like almost a, a reserve of the placenta, mm. because you know this organ has so much um, kind of overperfusion for what it does. But that that but that's important because the placenta takes a lots of hits as it as it grows older. Um, is that something that you've you know found kind of fleshed out in any sort of you know pathology research or? Um, I just I, more thoughts about the biological age of the placenta, what that actually means, because I, I think an older placenta is actually worse, which is kind of counterintuitive when you're talking about, you know, um, development when you think, you know, four year old is typically more capable than a one year old. <laughs> um, so my background is in math and physics, so just put that there, say, sure, sure. As, a, as, a, as a warner, warning, but that's something we talk a lot about and we're getting more and more fascinated about, especially these late placentas. And that is that is now actually um, that is now actually our, our recruitment focus. We try to get as many late ones post 36 weeks as we can. What we see a lot in our control cases, which, which are at that late gestation, is the increasing heterogeneity in all our parameters, which sort of totally fits with reserve capacity or anything, anything similar. Um, like all these, all these graphs, which look nice until a certain time point, sort of fall apart in late gestation because there's so much diversity. Yeah, as I said, this is really, a, this is, and also, I mean, I know that you also work with, with um, T1, with your fingerprinting, but adding T1, one of the motivations was the late gestation, looking at fibrin deposition, calcifications, that was our motivation. Yeah. I wouldn't say we are there, that we can say we see something, but that was the big motivation to try to really assess this, 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 um, this maturation. Mm -hmm. The maturation store score I've shown, I hope it's obvious, but just to make it even more obvious, is obviously a, a great simplification. This is the first attempt to get something automatic, which can potentially be used in the future. But I'm saying by no means that this maturation corresponds to anything biological. This is really a first attempt to get this in a, in a place where our obstetricians and radiologists are happy to start, <laughs> um, happy to start going in that direction. But it's a first attempt. Yeah. If I, know I can ask a, a kind of a personal question that kind of dovetails on that. I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, one of your papers is in the third rejection from MRM. And I, this is something I've been up against, too, with, with you know, MRF. Um, and it seems like techniques in this space, you know, struggle with this because we're, you know, we're taking techniques that have been well developed in the brain, applying them to placenta, and people kind of expect results from the get-go. And as you just said, right, I mean, the, the, the idea of, you know, correlating to some sort of physiological phenomena, all these MRI-based parameters we get, I mean, that, that's aspirational still. We're not there. Um, any any advice on how you're framing that or, or working through that? Because it, it can be really demoralizing. It can be demoralizing. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I don't know what, what, what advice I can have. I, but I think this is part of the excitement, you know? We take techniques which work well in other areas and, and we change them and make them bespoke to a really fascinating field. But obviously, I don't know. It's still early days and it's really complicated. And I often have the feeling that this doesn't come across in the review so nicely. No, you only have 30 cases. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just, just then as a word of encouragement too, it's, you know, something we're up against as well. I mean, this is, this is where the field is right now. You know, I was um, impressed by your um, ASL data and I was curious if you had any tips on that and whether you find it help or successful in anterior as well as posterior placentas, because that's something we've been struggling with is getting reasonable signal to noise on ASL. So I'm curious with the velocity of selective ASL. So I'm curious your experience with that. Um, so it is, it is worse. It was actually, this was actually one of the good reviews we got on this perfusion paper. One of the reviews pointed this point out very clearly. Well, show us it also works in posterior. But I think there we somewhere buried in the buried in a positive way. In the supporting material, we, we have shown it on a posterior and an anterior placenta. It's been working, the quantification has been working really well. And I think one of the reasons is that we, sort of coming from the brain world, we took 30 dynamics, right? And then we do this subtraction of 30 dynamics and add it up. But actually, this is way too much given how, the vas how vascular the placenta is. In good cases, sort of anterior cases, we get away with really a, sh a small number of, of dynamics and get really strong perfusion signal and it sort of, sort of stabilizes. Um, so I wonder if this is why, despite some of the raw images looking worse posteriorly, but the quantification seems all right, I think it might be because there's actually a lot of, a lot of signal because of the vascularity. It would be, would be, would be my take on it for now. And we have played a lot around with parameters. That's a pro that was a project with Utrecht, 
he's Tej van Osh, um, and with, with um, Anita, one of, one of his postdocs, where we really systematically scanned lots of placentas with all sorts of velocity cutoffs, mm -hmm. background suppressions, um, which was very frustrating, but I think very important work. Um, also, the direction is really important, the direction of the velocity encoding. It's so much stronger if it's, well, for obvious reasons, if it's AP, if the placenta is, is anterior or posterior. So um, I was quite surprised that these, these parameters had a huge, huge influence. <laughs> so we've now settled on one protocol. I'm not sure it's ideal, but it seems to relatively robustly get us data. I don't know if that's. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> have, you really have you experienced with anything else than velocity selective ASL? Because that's something we would be. We did a little PCAS at one point, but then for the same reasons that you said, um, mentioned, just getting the, the reliable label and getting only the maternal side, is that's why we quickly moved over to velocity selective ASL and been focusing on that. Yeah, same struggle. Uh, great talk. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, to actually ask you one thing about your uh, T2Star uh, T2Star in diffusion uh, acquisition. You do have uh, a refocusing pulse there, and I was wondering whether um, you could also kind of uh, tease out, uh, you know, uh, you know, just a T2 type uh, of signal, since uh, since your uh, relax uh, relaxation is probably mixed between T2Star and uh, you know and T2. Yeah. So you can kind of complete your T to start T one and uh, and have a uh, you know T two as well. It would be too lovely to be true. And to be to be fully honest, we have started um, trying also T two by adding multiple refocusing pulses. Obviously, we struggled a lot with face these problems, which is why we have stopped doing that. But um, yes, looking at the looking at the looking at the um, the K curves in more detail, especially given that we have this one first. Um, one after the refocusing and then the, the, then the real gradient echoes is something we are, or let's say our analysis collaborators are doing because indeed we hope that there is more information buried than we are using. Yeah, I have another question. How do you get all your mothers to lie on their back? <laughs> we definitely have a challenge with that in, in our patient population, especially when you get into the third trimester and the, the, yeah. the later ones. Um, do they all do that for you? They don't complain at all? Well, there was a big campaign in the UK last year um, advising women against sleeping on their back in late pregnancy. And this has definitely had an effect. So we have some moms coming, oh, I'm not really allowed to do, like, I really shouldn't do that. And this has been, I would say, very few cases. Most of them ended up being happy going in on their back. Um, we also have this supported supine position, which one of our radiographers, Ima Youth, um, has started, which is sort of just a tiny little tilt. For those who really don't want to go supine, they get this, this tiny tilt, which is still imaging-wise and field of view-wise pretty much supine. It gives them this, 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 this feeling. And again, we are really rigorous with, with life monitoring, especially when we started. We were super nervous about it. Um, and we did a lot of flow measurements. So Ima, Ima did that, face contrast flow measurements in the, in the IVC and then in, in collateral arteries. So we really took a safety approach. Um, but it's been a couple of hundred women now. And it's been, yeah, we had surprisingly little problem with, with them not wanting to do that. Plus, they all start on the left. That's another thing we, we figured out that quite often the, the weight of the uterus is then shifted on the left. And if they roll back slowly, um, it's not quite as compressed. Thanks. To follow up on that, what's the reason you want to image them all on spine? Consistency. I mean, there are now quite a number of papers emerging that the position matters, which I guess is not a big surprise. Um, and at least for us, it was the case that left lateral is not always the same exact left lateral. Sometimes there is compression, sometimes there isn't. So it, it's just, it just didn't feel like it was consistent enough to then get a, to take quantitative values away, which we can really say are not influenced by this. This is reason one. Reason two is the coil coverage. It's much better supine because it's directly on the table. And the third is planning. It makes planning just so much easier. Um, and especially planning, given that we have this acoustic noise restriction and we can't really turn our scans, we try to avoid turning our scans. That are sort of the yeah. advantage. 
the advantage is we perceive. I mean, they might not be real, but this is why we do it. Great, thanks. Yeah, do you actually measure the noise in the scanner? Do you have? We do. <laughs> we have optical microphones. We have this very controlled setup, always in ISO center. Like it's always the same for all sequences we want to try. We do measure it. We don't have a clear cutoff cutoff. Mm. We accept going slightly above certain values if it's very short, but especially for these long T2 star sequences, which are 10 minutes, we really limit it to below 96 dBA. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's something always, and always an interesting discussion because I feel there are a lot of centers who either vary a lot or vary not at all. <laughs> I don't know what your take is on, on, on noise. And uh, so to be honest, we haven't put a lot of effort into monitoring noise other than just the standard um, uh, limits that we have for yeah. postnatal imaging. So we haven't really um, had a need to, I guess, um, address that. Because it's interesting. In Europe, I know there's a lot of cons lot more concern about noise. I found the same thing with the neonatal imaging, too. A lot more concern about noise than, than we experience here. So I think there's... Um, mm. more attention put to that. So we've not had to address that, to be honest. Yeah. I never know if we are just go, going totally over the top. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I never know, but it, it forces us to, to, well, to work on acquisition challenges, I guess. <laughs> Yana, about positioning again. Um, so you said they are starting in left lateral position and turning back to spine. Are you waiting in that position for a while or is it immediately starting in left lateral and then turn? No, we wait for roughly, I think Ima would know the details, I would say two minutes. So they, okay. they have two blood pressures taken while they are in that position and then they are being instructed to the buffer and a couple of things happen. And then they are very slowly being rolled over. Yeah, and you, it is not like one hour total scan in spine position. You have two slots, like 30-30 or uh, are you... Taking that depends like on one hour, or is it depending on your protocol? Um, so we do one hour in supine, but mm -hmm. we give them a break. The break is not always strictly after 30 minutes, to be fully honest with okay. you. If there are sequences which are longer, then it might be after 35 or 40. And then there's a break. Is it like they are sitting position, or is it left lateral position? We force them to get out of the scanner completely, mm -hmm. to have a walk around, to go to the loo, to have some water and then complete fresh start. Okay. Which is for maternal comfort, but really also after realizing that the data acquired after 60 minutes without break starts to not look great. <laughs> because there's a bit of... Oh, okay. yeah. 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 That's why we now enforce this break, break on them. And, and then the break there... The clinical service as well too, force that break? So the curiosity for the clinical service, do they do that as well? Um, our clinical clinical protocol, which is just brain, is probably just around 35 minutes. But for example, the clinical congenital heart disease service, they would do that as well. Um, but they're also slowly moving to more supine. So more, more and more clinical things are also done in the supine position with the sort of same, same, same guidelines in place. Yeah. But it's not super strict, like our ethics, our ethics are more flexible than we are. And if there is a super amazing diffusion sequence, whatever going on, then as I say, we might go up to 40 minutes and then do the break. Yeah. It's not set in stone. Yeah. Perfect. We have four more minutes, I think. Is there <laughs> any other <laughs> questions? <laughs> Jeff, I expected you to ask why we're not using MR fingerprinting. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. We'll let you know. <laughs> I think, okay. you know, Jan, I mean, I think the, the other real challenge here is, is motion, right? And, and you know, your, your, your description of how you're going to kind of let the fetus be in charge and when the fetus wants to be quiet, then you, you know, do the structural imaging, right? I mean, I think that's a brilliant approach because that's where we stand right now with the acquisitions. But, you know, I think the other open... Um, problem or open question in the field is how you could do some sort of you know, more prospective motion, you know, mitigation on the acquisition mm -hmm. side. And that's something we're spending a lot of time thinking about, but we, I mean, we don't have any conclusions yet, but I, I mm. in, in answer to your question, I think, I think that, I think that's it implicitly, right. Is that, you know, it's, you know, all these sequences, especially as you stack up the encodings, right. Are, are become more and more powerful from a quantitative perspective. Once you get the reconstruction, 
but are become more and more vulnerable too, in, in some sense, unless mm -hmm. you can do, you know, motion correction yeah. as, you, as you go. And I think that's the challenge. So, yeah. yeah. And if I can follow up on Jeff's question that we discussed this this morning, you know, how do you quantify motion or um, scrub your data for motion? Do you, do you do it by eye or like, how do you judge whether it, a study is motion degraded or not? At the moment? Yeah. <laughs> At the moment, <laughs> there is still a lot by eye. We've now also started that's work by Alina Oos, who's, a, who's another postdoc in the department, um, to look at the outcome of registration. So if we register all these dynamics of the Tito star scans together, we can look at the Jacobians, we can look at the deformations in the hope that this is a better quantification for motion. Mm -hmm. But I would say that's still very much starting. Other than that, it's a lot of looking at scans, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we find the same, so we're just... <laughs> laughing at this because a reviewer that's sort of the same thing that Jeff was hinting at was asking us well how do you quantify motion and we're like you know placenta <laughs> you know it's really hard it is really really hard yeah. <laughs> okay I think uh, we can close the session and I really thank uh, thanks a lot for your uh, attention and joining us today uh, it was a great talk and it was a pleasure to host you here today. Uh, Real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank yes, you. Thank you, you Yana. Just uh, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. See you later. Thank See you, you soon. Thank you, Yana.